Hello, I'm Dr. Leonard Matheson. I'm a rehabilitation psychologist. I've been helping people put their lives back together after a serious illness or injury for almost 50 years. You've experienced a stroke, and I know you're concerned, but I don't want you to be discouraged. I'm glad you're here. We really can help. Today we're going to talk about modern stroke rehabilitation. Strokes used to be deadly, but now if you live near a good hospital, almost every stroke victim now survives. Strokes used to destroy quality of life, but that's no longer necessarily true, as long as you can actively participate in a good stroke rehabilitation program. Your stroke rehabilitation will be very different. We've learned so much in the past few years about how the brain recovers that your rehabilitation is going to be much more successful. In this video, I want to start with the science behind modern stroke rehabilitation. I'll be speaking from my experience with thousands of patients. My perspective is that faith and neuroscience go together to optimize modern stroke rehabilitation. Let's start by talking about what happened in your stroke. Basically, a lot of your brain nerve cells died. These are two different scans of the same brain after a stroke. The CT scan shows where this person has lost millions of neurons in the right hemisphere toward the back of the brain. The MRI scan, taken at about the same time, provides more specific information about what has been damaged and what is still healthy. This person has suffered a hemorrhagic stroke. A blood vessel burst and leaked blood into this area of the brain. About 15% of all strokes are hemorrhagic. The majority of strokes are ischemic. A blood clot stops oxygen-carrying blood from getting to a part of the brain and neurons begin to die. You probably have had at least one CT scan and maybe several. In all likelihood, you also had at least one MRI scan. But did you notice that when you came into the emergency room that people were asking you all kinds of questions about your symptoms and testing your vision and grip strength? They were doing this because it takes a while for many of the problems in your brain to show up on these scans. The first things that show up are what we call signs and symptoms of the stroke. That's why they were asking you questions and doing all that testing, even before they took you to have a CT scan or an MRI scan. This is because specific parts of the brain control specific functions, and we can learn a lot about what's going on in your brain by carefully asking you questions and doing different tests. You can learn to do the same thing to help track your progress as you go through rehabilitation. Be sure to ask your doctor and nurses and therapists to explain to you which parts of the brain relate to which questions or tests. The more you know about your brain, the more you can help actively participate in your stroke rehabilitation program. Be sure to ask which type of stroke you have experienced because you'll need that information to actively participate in limiting your risk factors to avoid another stroke. Now let's take a closer look at the nerve cells in your brain. Your brain's nerve cells are called neurons. The basic design is a cell body, out of which grow dozens or hundreds of dendrites, and one axon. At the tail of the axon are axonal synapses. Electrical signals are conducted from the cell body down the axon to the synapses. At the synapse, the electrical signal stimulates chemicals that pass the signal on to the next neuron. Now, I know this may be new vocabulary for you but it's important that you start to educate yourself about your brain. I want you to be able to take charge of your brain health and fitness. If you need to, feel free to back up over this section of the video to help you lock in your new learning. This is a simple model of how neurons connect to each other. Neurons can have from 1,000 to 30,000 connections to other neurons. Isn't that amazing? In our simple model, you can see that one neuron is passing a signal to another neuron, which is passing a signal to a third neuron. We used to think that the neurons were actually physically connected, but they're not. What we didn't know for a long time was that the synapse gap is so small that light waves are too big to squeeze through. When the electron microscope was invented, we saw that there was actually a gap. 
the gap is spanned by chemical molecules that are released from the axon tail. This simple finding has led to tremendous breakthroughs. For example, one of the causes of depression is not having enough of these chemicals to pass the signal along. Medicine to help build up the chemicals can help improve the person's mood and clarity of thinking. This is important for you to know because there are many other things besides medicines that can increase the synaptic chemicals. Proper nutrition and exercise and sleep all affect the availability of chemicals at the synapse. You need to know this because you're in charge of your nutrition, you're in charge of your exercise, and you're in charge of your sleep. Am I right? I like being right about this because I want to make it clear that to the degree that you participate in your rehabilitation by getting proper nutrition and exercise and sleep, you're going to take care of your neurons and synapses. You're going to do very well. Before we go on, let's take a closer look at the synaptic cleft or gap. This is where those chemicals pass the signal along. Each chemical molecule is shaped differently. In this case, they're round, but that's just to keep things simple. The point is that the shape of each molecule matters. The shape of the molecule helps it to fit into the specially shaped slots of the receiving neuron. It's like a key in a lock. If the molecule isn't the right shape, it won't go in and pass the signal along. So it's not just a question of having enough chemicals at the synaptic cleft. You've got to have the right chemicals, which means that you need to use the right medicine. We are getting better at giving patients the right medicine. But if you've had any medicine for depression, you know that it's still somewhat of a guessing game. Be patient and work with your doctor to get you set up with the right medicine. The more specific you can be about the effects of the medicine, the better your doctor will be at getting you set up properly. Neurons link together to help take care of you into neural networks. This is a picture of the neural networks in your brain. Although these each look like individual fibers, each fiber is a combination of several million axons. This would be like what an astronaut would see looking down at the American interstate highways from outer space. Only the interstates show up. This is somewhat more precise, showing nerve bundles that are made up of a few hundred thousand axons, kind of like the main streets in a major city. And here we have the individual neurons and neural networks. This would be like Google Maps showing you all the sidewalks in your neighborhood. In addition to helping you do what you want to do, neurons are always developing. As they're developing, dendrites and synapses are fragile and can be damaged and destroyed by stress chemicals, so they need to be protected. A middle-aged adult has approximately 100 billion neurons. Each neuron averages about 10,000 connections. Isn't that amazing? So even if your stroke caused you to lose millions or hundreds of millions of neurons, you've still got a lot left to work with. The linking up of the neurons is called neuroplasticity. This is the branching of dendrites and axons among neurons. Neuroplasticity is constantly pruning away neurons and linking neurons with other neurons to help you do what you want to do. Neuroplasticity is guided by experience. It occurs in response to demand. The more you do a meaningful task, the stronger the linkages. When you stop using a neuron, the linkages gradually become weaker. It's use it or lose it big time. Stroke rehabilitation harnesses your neuroplasticity to help you put life back together again. It does this by giving you thousands of just right challenges. A just right challenge is a task that's just beyond your current ability level. A meaningful task that's not too far beyond your current ability level will harness your neuroplasticity. You'll gradually develop the ability to handle that challenge and then move on to another just right challenge. Your doctors and therapists will help you learn how to do this. And after you're discharged from active care with them, you'll need to keep doing it yourself. The key is repetition, practice, 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 which will harness neuroplasticity to improve your ability. You're already familiar with Just Right Challenges, which you've been using to harness your neuroplasticity since you were a little kid. This little guy's curiosity to learn to read is harnessing his neuroplasticity. In fact, neuroscience tells us that curiosity is an important motivator. I want you to be curious about your recovery so that you can keep yourself motivated. 
I want your family to be curious as well. Stroke rehabilitation is really a family project. Everybody can look for and be excited by your success in mastering Just Right Challenges. Before your stroke, you had taken on Just Right Challenges to develop yourself in certain areas. You might have been a good librarian. You might have taken on Just Right Challenges to become a good carpenter. Your Just Right Challenges might have focused on becoming a good house painter, or a good musician, or a good nurse, or a good pilot, or a good truck driver. Whatever it was that you did well, you did well because you harnessed your neuroplasticity with a series of Just Right Challenges. Now that you've had a stroke, we're going to ask you to do the same thing. For the next several months, stroke rehab is going to be your job. You're going to look for and take on thousands of Just Right Challenges. It's going to be hard. It's going to take patience. It's going to take faith. It's going to launch you into an amazing experience that will help you appreciate how fearfully and wonderfully you've been designed. I hope you can hear the enthusiasm in my voice. Even after almost 50 years of guiding people through this process, I'm still amazed and excited about what God has designed into us. I have faith, the quiet confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The combination of faith and neuroscience gives me that quiet confidence. One of the best and early examples of recovery after a stroke is described in a story about Pedro Bacchirita and his family. In 1957, Pedro, a New York College professor, experienced a severe stroke that paralyzed the right side of his body and made him unable to speak. His son George was a medical student. George moved his father into his home and encouraged him to do as much as he could on his own. For example, every day for months, Pedro sat in the garden trying to pull weeds with his non-functional right hand. George and his medical school roommates worked with Pedro several hours each day, practicing basic activities such as washing his face and dressing. Over several months of intense repetition, Pedro gradually improved. Two years later, he was able to return to work as a college professor. He died of a heart attack five years after that while he was on a hike in the Andes. A brain autopsy found that the earlier stroke had destroyed 95% of the brain tissue that should have been required to do all that Pedro had done. Pedro's brain had recruited other parts to do the job that needed to be done. This was a powerful example of the potential plasticity of the brain and the utility of just right challenges. Inspired by Pedro's rehabilitation, another son, Paul Bach Irita, became a rehabilitation medicine physician who specialized in neuroplasticity. To demonstrate how broadly neuroplasticity works, he even helped blind people use tactile sensation in their tongue for the loss of vision. Videos are available online of his work and the experiences of his patients and people successfully treated by physicians and rehabilitation specialists he has trained. Some of the most impressive include videos of mechanisms that he developed to help blind people substitute tactile sensation in the tongue for loss of vision and return to mountain climbing. It's really amazing. I encourage you to look these up. Another great example that can provide good lessons for us is what happened to Jill Bolte Taylor and her mother. Jill is a brain scientist who suffered a severe stroke at age 37. She has written a wonderful book and presented an excellent TED Talk called My Stroke of Insight. I highly recommend both of them. Jill's book is especially helpful because it illustrates several important points. First, her rehabilitation occurred in the context of love. In her book, she describes how her mother came to the hospital and crawled into bed with her, holding her in the arms of love. Based on what we now know about neuroscience, we realize that this was wonderfully brain protective. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that later when we talk about the importance of your faith in God. Second, Jill developed values-based goals. This helped her identify a purpose in life greater than herself. This greater purpose gave meaning to each and every task that was assigned to her in rehabilitation. Dozens of times each day, she was faced with these just right challenges. 
As she mastered these, she gradually harnessed her neuroplasticity. Third, Jill's rehabilitation took about eight years. That's an awfully long time, isn't it? That's one of the reasons it's so important to have a counselor who can help you maintain your motivation. So, how can you get started? Well, first you need an interdisciplinary team to guide your rehabilitation. The best stroke rehab programs take an interdisciplinary approach. You've already been working with physicians and nurses and therapists. They helped you get through the early stages of your stroke to get you stabilized. As you transition to your outpatient program, you're going to continue to work with these professionals, but less often. You're going to have much more responsibility. This is a picture of students from the University of Southern California, where I used to teach and do research and practice. These students are practicing interdisciplinary care. They're learning to work together to help their patient in her own home. Most of your rehabilitation will be up to you and your family. You will check in periodically with your doctor and therapists to be sure that you're safe and do any troubleshooting that's necessary. But your stroke rehabilitation is now going to be pretty much up to you. As you take on more responsibility, you might feel overwhelmed or discouraged. I've been through this with thousands of people over the years. My patients have taught me that their faith in God made a big difference. I've been so impressed with this that I developed a new approach that I call Faithful Brain Counseling. In Faithful Brain Counseling, we work with you to use the messages of love and hope in the Bible to bolster your rehabilitation. I've written a book about this that I encourage you and your family to read. The young man I call Peter in Chapter 1 had a very serious brain injury with a lot of similarities to yours, although he had a lot going against him and a very poor track record up to that point in his life he became very successful. His faith and his family's church were crucial in his rehabilitation. As you read about Peter and the other people whose stories I share with you, you're going to be absolutely amazed how wonderfully God has designed us to respond to love that both protects and heals our brains. As a neuroscientist, I'm telling you that Jesus' commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself is absolutely the best medicine for your brain. And how about hope? Having a stroke is tough. Rehabilitation after a stroke is very difficult. But you survived and have an opportunity to put life together with great intention. The intention to live life to the full and your commitment to love God, yourself, and your neighbor will help you to experience what we call post-traumatic growth. I'm speaking to you as a person who's been doing this his whole life, and I want you to believe that you have a bright future available to you. So, thank you very much for your time and attention. Here are three helpful resources. First, go ahead and get my book. I think you'll like it. Your Faithful Brain, designed for so much more. It's widely available. You can get it on Amazon and other outlets. Second, subscribe to this channel. We've got a lot of Faithful Brain Counseling YouTube videos already posted, and we're adding more every week. Third, consider getting in touch with a Faithful Brain Counselor. These are people who integrate faith and neuroscience in their counseling practice. Get a hold of us, and we'll put you in touch with one of them. Thanks very much for your time and attention. Take care.